Here comes the only black jacket from season 7 to be named the best of the best. He was the contestant with the most challenge wins. Could you guess who I'm talking about? Okay, so how about another hint? This contestant is the most successful runner-up in HK history. And by the way, his flirty relationship with the winner of the season is still a hot topic to this day. Single. You want another one? Uh, I'm okay for the next seven seconds. Yep, of course, I'm talking about Jason Santos, folks. The man himself. Or as Chef Ramsay called him, Smurf! Come in here! <laughs> now, you see, Jay started his journey with a bang. During the signature dish challenge, he held his own as the fifth contestant from the blue team to get his dish judged by Chef Ramsay. Facing off against Stacy, he nailed it with a grilled hanger steak, corn and queso fresco salad, earning him praise for its spot on seasoning. One thing led to another and he walked away with the round. During the first dinner service chaos, Jay took charge of the Caesar salad duties, casually sharing that it was his first time in Hell's Kitchen while serving a customer who had a similar revelation. It's your first time here? Yep, me too. That's so wholesome. In the pork creation challenge, Jay was quick on the draw, snagging a pork chop as his weapon of choice. Paired with Salvatore, they were the final duo from the blue team to face judgment. And what was their creation? A Latin rub loin chop served with pinto beans. And it ended up being called... That's nice. Thank you, chef. Together, they outshone Maria and Scott, securing a win for the blue team with a score of 2-1 in the challenge. And you know what? Jay had a blast throughout the whole reward experience. Do that again. That was a religious oh experience. Yeah. Quite the flirt this guy is, huh? Anyway, in the barbecue-themed dinner service, Jay played double duty. First up, he rocked the waiter game during the initial seating. Then, he switched gears and teamed up with Benjamin on the appetizer station for the second seating, and he stood out in an otherwise clumsy service. Chef Ramsay even gave him a nod of approval for cranking out those appetizers with lightning speed. Jay! Yes, Chef! Well done, yeah. Next, in the 50th wedding anniversary planning challenge, his determination to rise up as a leader came into the focus. It's an opportunity for me to take control. I feel like it's his team versus my team. Assigned to the trout almondine dish, Jay took it on solo. He didn't just cook, he orchestrated. And he never underestimated his competition. I think hands down, my biggest competition definitely has been. May the best chef win. Presenting his pan-seared trout adorned with lemon, fennel leaves, and almonds, Jay showcased his culinary finesse. However, the verdict didn't swing in his favor against Benjamin. They're both very good dishes. The difference is minimal. The edge is in the red cheek. Thank you, chef. Damn, that was a close call. So when Jay returned to the lineup, Ramsay tossed him a lifeline, acknowledging that there was nothing to be ashamed of. The dish was a winner in its own right. Nothing to be ashamed about. Very good dish. They were both great. In my own head, it's sort of a tie. Even when he took a loss, he earned respect. In the kitchen prep the next day, Jay emerged again as a natural leader. But there was a setback. A really dangerous one. Armed with a knife to open a clam, Jay ended up with a nasty cut on his finger. Why? I just cut myself pretty bad. Oh, God. True to form, Jay, claiming it was his first cut in a decade, didn't let this mishap slow him down at all. He took a little detour to the back hallway, met with a medic, and casually perched on a chair, applying pressure to the wound. Feeling lightheaded. In a matter of minutes, Jay bounced back into the kitchen, reassuring everyone that he was absolutely okay. It was a brief hiccup, but Jay's resilience and lighthearted approach to the situation showed that in the heat of the kitchen battle, he could handle the heat, or even a little blood, like a pro, and even his teammates knew it. Jay's a warrior. He'll, he'll forget about it, throw a finger cut on, throw a glove on, whatever it may be. Next, in the gourmet sandwich challenge, Jay was confident about his foie gras sandwich, and Ed saw him as tough competition. He faced off against Fran, whose chicken and roasted peppers combo didn't impress Chef Ramsay at all, reminding him of 1982. Then, Jay brought in his A-game with a country pork pate sandwich featuring foie gras fat, Vietnamese-influenced slaw, and romaine hearts. And Chef Ramsay loved it, praising its taste and texture, and Jay snagged the win over Fran. Easily. It stands up well. Thank you, Chef. It tastes delicious. These challenges definitely showed how creative he was, and yeah, individually he was a star, but he was also a great team player. You'll see why with this video. Anyway, in the 10th service, Jay, manning the appetizer station alongside Autumn, wasn't just focused on his tasks. When he noticed that Nilka was starting to unravel, he didn't hesitate to step in. Nilka, you got this. I got it. Just focus. Despite his attempts to comfort her initially not landing, he didn't give up. Feeling for her as the pressure mounted, he shifted gears and went to her aid on the fish station. I'm just so fucking 
mad at myself. It's cool, just take a deep breath. Jay wasn't just an observer, he became a support in the heat of the meltdown. Advising Noka to communicate, he recognized that as the key. Even when her panic persisted, he stayed level-headed, urging her to take a deep breath and refocus. When Chef Ramsay called for the turbot, Jay's kitchen instincts kicked in. Rather than just following orders blindly, he intervened, advising Noka not to flip it yet, noting that it needed more color. When the famous chef pressed again, Jay played the middle ground, giving an additional 30 seconds. All the while, he kept pushing Noka to communicate, understanding the critical role it played in the kitchen's operation. 30 seconds, call 30 seconds, chef! You just gotta communicate, you'll be fine. Oh, sorry, chef, scallops. Now, while I'm presenting him in a way that sounds perfect, his journey wasn't a flawless one. It was the 12th dinner service, and Jay's performance left much to be desired, especially when it came to communication. When he presented his John Dory to the pass, it was disappointingly overcooked. This earned him a berating from Chef Ramsay for seemingly taking the situation lightly. Yeah, I don't want any butter in the fucking door. I just want it nicely fucking sautéed. His assessment of the fish station as a mess didn't inspire confidence at all. And well, despite Chef Ramsay's encouragement to bounce back, the struggles continued. Jay get yelled at. He he, you know, kind of fucking crumbled. Communication became a glaring issue when, despite being asked three times by Jason for a time, Jay failed to respond promptly, leaving the kitchen in a pretty bad state after the station switches. I got one minute on two door and a scalp. Ah, finally. Even when he did call out for a time, Chef Ramsay wasn't happy about the chaos that ensued. Unbelievable. One simple task, switch sections, and we all fucking start sinking. Moving to the meat station on the third switch, Jay's confusion reached new heights. He failed to grasp the details of the next ticket, leaving both his teammates and Chef Ramsay a bit confused. Because at this point, everyone expected only the best from him. How long on the tuna? You have two halibut. What? His attempt to serve Wellingtons to the dining room resulted in a return due to overcooking, prompting an urgent refire request from Chef Ramsay. Jay, two Wellington, urgently. When asked for a time on the Wellington refire by Holly, Jay's response of 14 minutes left her in disbelief. 14 minutes? Yeah. Okay. But wait and watch what happens. Jeff, two refire Wellingtons. You said 14 minutes. No, no, the next one. Those are the refire ones. Oh my god. These miscommunications about the timing added to the chaos, with Chef Ramsay questioning if there was an intentional sabotage going on here. Are you doing this to make yourself look good? No, Chef. So why can't you talk to a refire coming? Returning to the appetizer station on the fourth switch didn't bring any relief. In the end, Jay's communication with Autumn on the meat lacked a lot of accuracy, adding to the overall frustration in the kitchen. Jay really didn't let me know what was going on when I came onto the station. He kind of just ran to the next station. He was definitely off his game. Like zero communication whatsoever. Just like what happened in the following service when Jay found himself stationed on appetizer duty. The initial risotto that he sent out fell really short in the flavor department. Come on, seasoning, a little more lemon, bland, come on. Chef Ramsay called for more seasoning, but Jay, thinking it was merely under-seasoned, maintained his stance. However, Ramsay's insistence prompted him to swiftly adjust, providing a one-minute turnaround that caught the chef's attention, urging him to step up his game. Get it on, another yeah, one. Yeah, chef, it's on, it's on. And he actually followed through, because Jay started sending out a series of flawless risottos to the pass. However, a slip-up occurred when he sent potatoes out, which was a momentary lapse in judgment considering they weren't requested at all. Maybe he was overcompensating for his previous mistakes? I was trying to go so fast that I got ahead of myself by one ticket. Now, amidst the chaos of that night, Jay's attempt to assert leadership saw him managing tasks like keeping an eye on the beef in the convection oven. You get duck beef and then two Wellington and then two chicken. The ensuing communication during ticket calls, particularly one appreciated by Benjamin, illustrated a marked improvement in performance. And what do you know, during the post-service lineup, the chefs were lauded for their best performance yet, and Jay, of course, stood out. Recognized for taking control and leading his team, he earned the rare honor of being named the best of the best. You took control and you led. Now, don't stop doing that. This accolade wasn't just a reflection of a single service, but an acknowledgement of Jay's ability to rebound swiftly from challenges, pushing his limits to rise to the top. In the 14th dinner service, Jay took charge of the appetizer station and confidently led the pass, drawing on the 13 years of experience as an executive chef. Things started off well, with work on the scallops and risotto going very smoothly. Scallops going up with the salad. Get a risotto coming, please. Risotto's coming right now. Thank you. A bit of frustration crept in when Jay felt that he put in more effort than Benjamin, who hadn't worked as long. 
However, as the service progressed, his mood lifted, and Jay continued to demonstrate his strong leadership. He showed a truly keen eye for detail when he spotted sous chef Scott's mistake of using lobster instead of crab in the crab capellini. God, this is lobster, not crab. It is, are you yes. sure? I'm sure. This trend continued when the intentional error was repeated in a lobster risotto with crab, and Jay once again caught it, earning additional praise and a bit of satisfaction against his demanding colleague. This risotto has crab in it, chef. Are you sure? I'm sure. Good. Well, well, too. As the service concluded, Jay's execution of Benjamin's Wellingtons was on point, contributing to a successful finish for his last table. However, a little hiccup occurred during Holly's turn at the pass, when Jay, serving his risotto, accidentally spilled some on Chef Ramsay's apron. Unbelievable. Sorry, Chef. This mishap irked Chef Ramsay, prompting Jay to offer four apologies before being sternly told to do this. Oh, fucking hell, guys. Jay! Wake up, Jay! But all in all, he was pretty consistent, a natural leader, and was named as the first finalist of the season. Now, let's take a quick look back at his performance. With a mix of nerves and determination, Jay confidently called out the orders, realizing that this was a make or break moment in his culinary journey. Guiding his team, he pushed even someone as inconsistent as Fran to deliver beautifully cooked scallops. All right, make sure you have enough oil in your pan. Yes, sir. So you can get a really good sear on those. Yes, sir. Isn't that amazing? However, when she admitted to burning them, Jay was a little bit shaken, acknowledging the challenge of working with someone who seemed a bit lost despite having the best of intentions. But he stayed calm and guided her through the storm. Later, Jay asked Jason to ensure the lamb was cooked properly, even attempting a strategic move with a refire. Jason, why is this like this? Because it was raw, you can't serve that, dude. Good catch. Frustrations rose when the lamb wasn't up to par, leading Jay to make it clear that the night demanded nothing short of perfection. Eventually, when Jason nailed the lamb, Jay emphasized the importance of consistency. I can send the table, yes? Yes. Don't fuck with me, okay? Noticing a detail slip with improperly sliced lamb, Jay tactfully directed Jason to make a correction. Observing Jason's adverse reaction to Chef Ramsay's yelling, Jay opted for a calmer approach, successfully getting the lamb accepted. What I thought I should do to get the best out of him, and I sort of babied him a little bit. Now, that's a leader if I've ever seen one. As the service reached its peak, Jay urged his team to pick up the pace, turning it into a race against time. They successfully completed all the remaining tickets, earning Jay praise from Chef Ramsay. You see, Jay has always been very passionate about food and is definitely one of the best runner-ups in the show's history. And to emphasize that distinction, he took on the role of the blue team sous chef from season 19, succeeding sous chef Jockey. Plus, viewers loved him, both for how calm and how goofy he could be. And well, I'm all here for it. Others said that he stood out for not being a prick like sous chef Scott. Anyway, what's your take on him? If you ask me, I think Chef Jay was born to slay. Oh, that rhymed. <laughs> Before hitting his ninth birthday, he was already a prodigy. While his pals were glued to Sesame Street, he put on his apron and hit the kitchen at his grandma's place, all while tuning in to Julia Child, the original TV chef extraordinaire. Fast forward to when he was 19, Jay proudly graduated from Newberry College's culinary arts program in Newton, Mass. He kicked off his culinary journey at Tremont 647 under the wing of Andy Husbands. In the kitchen, he climbed the ranks like a culinary rock star, eventually snagging the title of executive chef. After about six years of perfecting his own unique cooking style, Jay set his sights on a new adventure. In 2005, he joined an interesting business by the name of Gargoyles on the Square as their executive chef. And guess what? He worked his culinary wizardry once again, transforming this restaurant from a local favorite to a must-visit dining spot for people from all over. Following his stint on the show, Jay initially resumed his role at Gargoyles and made appearances on several morning television programs like Simply Ming and Beat Bobby Flay. Expanding his footprint in the culinary world, Jay became a restaurateur, owning establishments such as Abbey Lane, Buttermilk and Bourbon, Citrus and Salt, and Blue Ink. He collaborated with Salvatore at Blue Ink, and they continue to be friends to this very day. Diversifying his television presence, Jay became a recognized expert on Paramount Network's Bar Rescue. Oh yeah, we've got a crossover on our hands. He made his debut in Season 5, Episode 12, titled Punk as a Drunk, where John Taffer and his crew swooped into the Triple Nickel Tavern. And yeah, he worked right beside him as his main man. He's instigating. Oh, They're like teenagers. The bar, under the ownership of J.J. Gruder since 2005, had seen its fair share of challenges. 
JJ, a former music industry pro, had faced immense personal loss, grieving the passing of three family members to cancer in a very short time. Right after the bar opened, my sister died. She had cancer. Then my mom got diagnosed with cancer. In an attempt to cope, JJ found solace in the party atmosphere of his own establishment. In 2015, Jacob joined the scene as the manager, brimming with fresh ideas for the bar's improvement. Sadly, JJ wasn't all ears for Jacob's suggestions. It was then that Jay stepped in, not as just a culinary expert, but as a guide for JJ and Jacob, demonstrating how to whip up a simple yet delectable burger. Jay's journey with Bar Rescue didn't end there, though. In Season 6, Episode 20, titled Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Fat Balls, he lent his expertise to Fat Balls Sports Bar and Grill in Jacksonville, Florida. This time around, Jay took on the task of training the kitchen staff in the art of seafood dishes. Season 7 brought Jay back on the scene in Episode 14, titled Fear and Molding on Pineapple Hill. It, it makes perfect sense why you would. She's a single girl that draws in the men. I would especially make sure she felt comfortable. The Pineapple Hill Saloon and Grill, nestled in Tustin, California, faced challenges that Jay, ever the problem solver, tackled head on. From stopping the service of moldy ribs to providing crucial kitchen hygiene training to Martin, the prep cook, Jay once again proved to be a valuable asset to John Taffer. Then again in Season 8, Episode 2, titled Not Your Grandfather's Speakeasy, Bar Rescue featured Capo's Restaurant and Speakeasy in Las Vegas. Owned by Nico Santucci, who moved from Chicago in 2002, had turned Capo's into a significant success, pulling in close to $5 million annually. Nico's brother Dominic managed the place. Capo stood out as one of the more successful bars John Taffer had tackled on the show, quite different from the usual struggling spots. This episode took place during the challenging times of the pandemic, a situation many bars face in the first half of Season 8. Chef Jay Santos and local blogger Lindsay Stewart went undercover to spy on the bar for John Taffer. Their order of meatballs, an old-fashioned, and a Chianti revealed some shortcomings. The Chianti wasn't good, and the bartenders couldn't say how long the bottle had been open for. The salad was brown, and the meatballs were so dry. When Nico didn't take the criticism very well, tensions rose, but John Taffer stepped in to defuse the situation. The subsequent inspection showed the owners the true state of their bar. Jay Santos then took the staff through the ropes, teaching them how to make a meatball sub with a twist, served on a buttered baguette. Anyway, professional life aside, in a joyous personal development, Jay tied the knot and later embraced the role of fatherhood when he and his wife welcomed their daughter in August of 2022. Dudes had a hell of a life. But hey, he's still living it. And who knows, maybe someday Chef Jay will go for a crossover hat trick and show up on Master Chef or something. Just, uh, stay away from takedown with Chris Hansen, please. Anyway, back to the realm of things that might actually happen. How many of you want to see him come back to Hell's Kitchen in a future season? Make sure to drop your thoughts in the comment section down below. And Chef Jay, if you're by any chance watching this, the community loves you. You and your blue hair. Now, if you enjoyed this video, drop a like, subscribe, and turn on my post notifications. And if you thought this video was crazy, then make sure to check out this next one right here since it's even better.